This is Mr. Mark Hall Patton, who is the curator and administrator of the Clark County Museum System, which currently consists of three, three, see so that's three, three museums. And some of you may know him from something else he does, that he occasionally appears on TV, that we all are here pretty much because of the second thing he does, not the first thing he does. Mark and I had, we're back a little ways, and when he speaks locally at some of yeah. the functions, I have been known to actually ask him to stop talking because his time was up. In this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let Mark have free reign, and we're going to enjoy ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark on that. Understand if you have a question or you want to try to correct me, please feel free. One of the things that I've learned in running museums for 37 years, and I have been doing that, um, appearing on now six television shows, um, one of the things I've learned throughout all of that is people are very generous when you make a mistake. <laughs> they will point it out to you no matter where you are or what you are doing. So if you think I've made a mistake, feel free to, to correct me or tell me that you think I've made a mistake. That's all right. Um, and, and I'll start my talk with, before we actually get into what my subject is, I want everybody to know that if you do watch Pawn Stars, I've been on a uh, third of the shows. I've been on 130 shows with Pawn Stars. Um, I'm now on the United Stuff of America on H2. I'm on American Facts and Fallacies, on Military Channel, and on a bunch of different shows, because I'm cheap, and I have no shame on camera, so, you know, it's like, well, you want to do this one as well? Sure, why not? Um, but I want you to know that I've made one error. In 130 appearances, I have made an error, and I'm going to tell you what it is, because you never know when this is going to come up in your life. Is it the one where you let them call you the beard of knowledge? No. <laughs> Trust me, out of some of the other things I've been called, that's not bad. You know? But no, if, if you are ever offered a Soviet ICBM launch key, <laughs> and you think it might be a Soviet rocket launch key, which is what I thought they were, then it is. But the way that you tell the difference is you take the key, it's not marked in any way, you take the key and you lay it on a flat surface. If the prong on the key is parallel to the surface, it's a rocket launch key. I mean, it's, it's an ICBM launch key. If it's perpendicular to the surface, it's a rocket launch key. The other thing you can tell is the center shaft of the ICBM launch key is one-tenth of an inch smaller in diameter. So I don't want you to make the same error that I did. You know, when I said that it was a rocket launch key rather than a Soviet ICBM launch key. So you can run into such things at times. But uh, today what I, I thought I would talk about is uh, the first 20 years of the re-legalization of gaming in Nevada. Now I'm not going to give you a list of all the clubs that were here. You guys already have those lists. They've been published. You've got great reference material for that. But I want to talk a little bit about what went on with the relegalization and some of the things that were going on in Southern Nevada at the time. Because we tend to think about, you know, gaming started in 1931. Wrong. Gaming was legalized in Nevada in 1869. It was legal in Nevada until 1910. And then as part of a big progressive push up in Carson City, there was a big sense that we've got to get rid of all these evil things like alcohol and gaming, only we called it gambling then, because we understood that if you gambled, you might win once in a while. If you game, you don't, then you're just paying to watch the nights go around, so it's all right. Um, but it, it actually was legal in the state until 1910. Then as part of this progressive push, we made it illegal in 1911. We also made drinking illegal. Can you imagine the state of Nevada where we're a temperance state? I mean, it was illegal to have alcohol here. And this is eight years before the country went dry. 
you know, we said, no, we're going to go dry because we're, you know, we're going to clean up this state. And so we went dry. Now, part of what you have to understand when you start looking at the history of, of gaming and the history of drinking, somehow those seem to go together a lot of times, um, in Nevada is we also don't pay much attention to the law. So here in southern Nevada, now we were a little tiny place in 1910. Now this was just a watering hole along the railroad. You know, the big city in the state was Reno up north. But when the railroad came through, when they laid out Clark's Las Vegas town site, and understand that Clark's Las Vegas town site was the second Las Vegas laid out here. The first one was the original Las Vegas town site which was laid out in 1904 by a fellow named J.T. McWilliams. We think of it as the west side today, but that was actually laid out a year before Clark's Las Vegas town site. The problem was J.T. McWilliams, who was a surveyor and worked for the railroad, realized that the railroad would be putting a town here, didn't realize that the railroad owned the water. And so he could have his town, but he wasn't going to get any water. And the railroad wasn't going to give up on all the money that they were going to make by selling lots and having their own town. So they basically just cut off the west side and created their own town. That's what we think of as Las Vegas today. That's the one that started in May of 1905. Now as they laid out the community, the railroad thought about some level of social engineering. And what they were looking at is how do you keep people from having bars and brothels and gambling halls all over town. Well, you do that by setting aside a couple of blocks. And so they set aside Block 16. How many of you have heard of Block 16? Good. How many of you have heard of Block 17? A few. Well, Carrie, you don't count. You know this. <laughs> um, I've known Carrie for years. He, he understands this. Block 17 was right next to Block 16, and that was where Blacks, Hispanics, and Chinese could gamble, drink, and, and go to the brothels. Block 16 was for the whites. Initially, it was whites and Hispanics, because Hispanics were considered white at that point. But then we changed our minds, and they had to go to the other one. Now, if you wonder where Block 16 was, you all know where uh, Main Street Station is? The parking lot across the street. That's Block 16. The continuation of the parking lot is Block 17. That's where it was. Now, Block 16 and Block 17, you know, remember, 1911, you know, we're going dry, we're getting rid of gambling, and so, of course, we're going to shut down Block 16 and 17, right? No, we didn't do that. We continued to have the bars running. We continued to have, we, we would have raids there every so often. At one point, the chief of police actually issued an order that you had to take down all the signs advertising alcohol. Now think about that. It's the middle of prohibition. It's illegal to sell alcohol. But what Percy Nash was worried about was whether or not you had signs up for Budweiser. <laughs> and literally, he went around and started handing out tickets if you had a sign outside. You know, interestingly, it wasn't until 1929 that we finally shut down Block 16 and Block 17. And we did it for a couple of days. <coughs> and you might wonder, why bother? Well, in 1923, a bill had been passed to create the Colorado River Commission. Eventually, out of that came the Black Canyon Project and today's Hoover Dam. In 1929, Elwood Mead and Wilbur Lyon came out here to try to decide whether or not the workers on the dam project were going to live in Las Vegas. Now understand that Elwood Mead and Wilbur Lyon were extraordinarily strong temperance fanatics. Everybody in Las Vegas knew they were coming. So the Las Vegas authorities said, fine, we're going to shut down 16 and 17. Not only are we going to order every bar, every brothel, every gambling establishment closed, 
But you had to take down your signs, you had to board up your front doors, you had to board up your windows. It was closed. It was going to be closed when they were there because we wanted the workers from the dam to live in Las Vegas, or the folks in Las Vegas wanted that. I live in Henderson, so I don't have to say that. <laughs> but they wanted them to live in Las Vegas. So Elwood Mead came out, and the lion came out, and they're being fed in, they're having dinners and all of this. And I'm, and I'm going to pause here for just a second. Are there any media in the audience? OK, I can continue the story. Um, <laughs> and you'll understand why when you hear it. What happened was there were a couple of reporters. They grabbed one of the guys from Mead and Lion's group and got him off to one side and said, let us show you around. And they said, OK. And so they went down to Block 60 and they went to the Arizona Club. Now, the Arizona Club was closed. You know, there was no sign. Front door is boarded up. The windows are boarded up. The side door was open. The bartender was inside. So they sat there and drank all afternoon. And when they realized that the train was pulling out, they got the guy back to the train just in time so that he could make the train to head back to Washington. But he was looped. I mean, this guy was no longer sober, and he was carrying on about what a great place Las Vegas was. Which is why we have Boulder City. <laughs> because Mead and Lion decided there is no way we want our workers to live in Las Vegas. We don't want them drinking. We don't want them gambling. That's not what we want. We want to control what their life is going to be. We want to socially engineer it so that they are better workers. And so what did they do? They created Boulder City. Now remember, Boulder City is the only place, the only incorporated city in the state of Nevada today that does not have gaming. And it's because it started out as a federal reservation. And as a federal reservation, you only got on the reservation, you only got into town if you had a reason to get into town. You actually hit the gate across a state highway manned by U.S. Marshals that would stop you there. And if you didn't have a reason for going on to the reservation or going down to the dam site, you did not get in there. And if you happen to be a worker at the, on the dam project and you had taken the day off or it was a weekend and you'd gone into Las Vegas or some other little establishment along Boulder Highway, and you had enjoyed yourself, you'd better not come back drunk because you were stopped there at the gate. And the first time you were held there until you sobered up. And it didn't care, they didn't care whether it was 130 degrees outside or what. You were held there until you sobered up. The second time that happened, your family was brought out to you and you were fired on the spot. And there was no questions asked. So that's why we have Boulder City there. Let me see where I'm at here. So we've got all of this going on, and we've got you know uh, prohibition going on, and the dams uh, starting up. And in 1925, before all of this started, there was an attempt to legalize gaming again in the state. And in 1927, there was an attempt to legalize gaming in the state. And in 1929, because of course we have the, the every other year uh, state legislature. So they tried for a number of times to legalize gaming. Couldn't get it through the state legislature. Just wasn't getting anywhere. And so in 1930, a couple of guys, sons of Mamie Stock. Many of you probably know that name. She received the first gaming license in Las Vegas. But her son, because she was running the Northern Saloon at that point. Now notice, the Northern Saloon. We're in the middle of Prohibition. <laughs> we don't pay much attention to the law if we don't have to like it. So she's running the Northern Saloon. Now, is it? Is she really running it? No. Oscar, her husband, is running it. Oscar worked for the railroad. The railroad didn't want their workers to have other jobs, especially illegal ones. And so Oscar didn't show up on the ownership. Mamie, his wife, showed up on the ownership. He was the one that wanted the gaming license. Why did he want a gaming license? To cover up the speakeasy. 
It wasn't because they were going to make any money with it. And most of the early gaming licenses were like this. So, but nonetheless, she was the one that got the first gaming license in her name. But her sons actually convened a meeting of some of the other club owners here, saloon owners that had gaming in their places. And tried and, and asked them about donating money so that they would have some cash for gratuities up in Carson City to perhaps grease the skids a bit for legalized gaming. They raised ten thousand dollars in one meeting, so there's a lot of people that wanted it legal here. Well, in 1931. A rancher from Winnemucca by the name of Phil Tobin finally introduced a bill that was passed. And that's when we became, that's when gaming became legal here. There is no information that I've been able to find that Phil knew anything about the, the other gratuities which may or may not have been spread around up there. Somehow, when you're handing out a bribe, most people don't keep records. So, yeah, you gotta kind of think maybe, maybe not. But the fact was, we had gaming again. Of course, we also had divorce and marriage. We took what had been a six month waiting period and turned it into a six week waiting period. Why would you do that? Well, because they wanted the money. The state wanted the money. The gaming was legalized under the provision or, or under the, the argument that this is happening anyways. And you know, drinking, everybody knew drinking was going on, but that was a national thing, so we had to wait a couple of years on that. But on gaming, everybody knew that, that gaming was happening all over the state. So why not tax it? You know, if if the state's going to do something, how do you make money on it? You know, and Nevada is no different than anywhere else. You know, if you're going to have something, let's tax it. Sounds good to me. We've got legalized brothels here. Why do you do that? You can tax it. You know, but we actually got both the divorce and marriage um, changed to six weeks, and we got legalized gaming. Now, the legalized gaming was kind of interesting because not everybody got it. You know, the early licenses were um, somewhat few and far between. There were some that, that were um, pretty well known, you know, like, like uh, the Northern Club, like maybe Stalker's Place. But uh, even in Las Vegas, let me take a look here, in the first two months, there were only six licenses issued. So you're talking about that it became legal, by the way, in February of 1931. Now, after that first two months, by April, there had only been six licenses in Las Vegas. Now, there were also licenses in the county, and those were different. The way that the law had been passed, it said you could have city licenses, you could have county licenses, you could have state licenses. So, everybody could make a few bucks on it. And a lot of the, the licenses went to places that, like I say, wanted to cover up their speakeasies. In 1931, in April of 1931, one of the big pro he as they were called, raids here happened. Um, that was the, the, actually the Arizona Club, the Owl, the Desert Club, the Bungalow, the Blue Heaven, and the Mineral Club were all raided on the same day. Now most of those had gaming licenses, but the gaming was to cover up the speakeasy. The speakeasy was where you made money. The gaming wasn't where you made money at first. Now that still didn't stop us. You know, we could continue to, you know, we, we, we continued to drink. Even when they knocked over all these places, the, the, the prohibition agents knew that they hadn't stopped booze in Las Vegas and some of the bad. There were, there were um, bootlegging stands all the way along Boulder Highway, all along the river, um, out in the Muddy River area, it was some of the most, most heavily bootlegged areas. But there were bootleggers, bootleggers active up in the Amargosa Valley. They were all over the place. 
basically anywhere that there was water, you'd have people bootlegging. You know, and they were shipping it in. Had one incident, by the way, in case you ever think that bootleggers were all just kind of those, those cute old guys from the South that you see on television these days. There was an incident in the Amargosa Valley where there was a guy named Bill. Bill worked for a bootlegger up there. Now, Bill made a mistake. He started sampling the brew. Bad idea. He made a second mistake, and he started watering down the brew that he was sampling. So the bootlegger got a bad rep. Well, the bootlegger fired him and blackballed him with all the other bootleggers, so he couldn't get a job. So Bill made his third and final mistake, and he turned over to the prohibition agents where the truck was coming in from the bootlegger, the, the operation up in the Amargos Valley, and the truck was knocked over and all the booze was taken. <coughs> the next thing we find out about Mr. Bill is his body was found staked out to a mesquite bush. Now when I say staked out, you have to understand mesquites have thorns that are anywhere from two to about six inches long. And he was literally staked onto this bush and he'd been shot in the stomach and allowed to bleed out. You find a body, looks like some criminal activity, you have a coroner's jury. Coroner's jury was convened right at the body Two of the guys that people thought probably had killed him were on the coroner's jury. <laughs> and they came back with a ruling that it was a suicide. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill was buried under that mesquite bush out in the Amargosa Valley. So in case you ever think that bootleggers were nice guys, they weren't. But we ended up with gaming legal. We had the... the uh, uh, bootlegging and speakeasies going on. One of the ones that I like was the oldest club that's still operating here in the state, which is Railroad Pass. And I'm sure many of you have been out to Railroad Pass. Railroad Pass was opened in 1931. Railroad Pass was located where it is because it was sitting on a patented mine site. Now, when you patent a mine site, it's a legal process. It means that the federal government can't kick you off the land, in case you wonder why it's sitting there. So in 1931, when they were building the railroad to, that was going to go from Arden all the way out to Boulder City to carry all the supplies to this new dam project, and they had this new community being built in Boulder City, no gaming, no booze there, right around the corner, they built railroad paths. In fact, the first load that that branch of the railroad carried was lumber to build railroad paths. Didn't have to go quite all the way to Boulder City. And they opened up Railroad Pass, and they opened it up as a casino. It still has gaming license number four for the state of Nevada. It's the only single digit one that I'm aware of that's still active. But the interesting thing was, as you walked into Railroad Pass, there was a table game, there were a few slot machines, and that was it, but there was another door. You had to know the right word to get through that door to get into the bar. Anybody know? He said it. Swordfish. No. Oh. <laughs> but it was a good movie, though. I enjoyed the movie. No, actually, the, the word was gaiety. So if you knew gaiety, then you could get in the bar, and at the bar, you could get brandy in any flavor you wanted. Because they had a 50-gallon drum of grain alcohol sitting there that they would split, they would, they would water it down to a half or a quarter straight, and then they'd mix it with any flavor you wanted. So you could have lemon brandy or blackberry brandy or cherry brandy, whatever you wanted, you could get it there. You know, and that's why they got the gaming license. It wasn't for the gaming at that point. It wasn't until 33 when uh, booze became legal that gaming really was more what they were looking for. Um, there's a, I've got a quote for you. Um, there was a fellow named Henry Hall who was one of the, the earliest patrons there. And he was, he was interviewed a number of years ago and he said, 
They'd buy five gallon cans of alcohol, which was 200 proof. They'd cut it to at least 50%, probably more, and they put flavoring in. You wanted blackberry brandy? Why they made blackberry brandy? They just put flavoring in. And that's what you had. But that casino obviously is still running. Now, it wasn't the only one there. On the other side of the road, there was the Mace, and there was the Circle, there was the Star Club. All of those had burned down or been torn down over the years because those weren't on patented mine sites. There was no, they, they didn't own the land in the same way. But the railroad pass is still there, even though for years, the people in Boulder City, the authorities there, tried to get it shut down. But they couldn't. Legally, they had no right to that. You wonder about the casino that's down by the dam? I think it's called the Roadster. No, the Hacienda now. They keep changing the name. I think of it as Fort Lucinda, but that's a few years ago. That's also sitting on a patented mine site. National Park Service has tried to shut that thing down for years, and they can't. So sometimes when you look at these things, you might wonder, well, now how come that one's there and there's no more around it? Well, that's the only mine site there. You know, there's no other land that anybody can build on. And everything else has been pulled out of the public hands. It's, it's part of the National Park. But that one isn't. That's privately owned. And that casino will continue to uh, go there. Of course, the, the casino that most people remember from these early years was Tony Carnero's The Meadows. You know, and that was a big deal. That was the fancy one. Cost $31,000 to build. And uh, now, I don't know that Tony had anything to do with legalizing gaming. I don't want to say that he did. He did start building that before gaming was legalized, however. So I don't know whether he was just you know, very good at prognostication, but uh, he did start building it before it actually became legal, um, he and his brothers. But uh, he was down in the corner of Fremont and Charleston, approximately. Yes, I know Carrie wasn't exactly there. It was over a little bit more. I got that. I'm, I'm looking at Carrie going, I don't want to shake my head, but I know where it was. But uh, what I like is there's another old casino down there that still exists. And that's the Dead of the Seven Thieves. You all remember that one? No. You might know it as the Silver Saddle today. That one was opened in 1932 as the Den of the Seven Thieves. And let me see if I can find my note, because it became then the Black Cat Inn, the Kit Kat Club, the Saddle Club, the Silver Dollar Saloon, and the Silver Saddle. But that is a very early casino there. And it's probably the earliest building in that area now that the Green Shack is gone. But it's one of those that, it's been down there a long time. Um, the Meadows was the one that most people tend to think about. You know, they had uh, the Gump Sisters there, uh, had Julie Garland in it, in it and uh, you know, it was one that the, the Las Vegas Age uh, described it as potent in its charm, mysterious in its fascination. The Meadows, America's most luxurious casino, with open, will open its doors tonight and formally embark on a career which all liberal-minded persons in the West will watch closely. Yeah. Okay, you know, of course the fact that it burned down on Labor Day 1931, eh, that was a bit of a problem. Why did it burn down? Well, it was outside of city limits. And Las Vegas Fire Department refused to go out there because they only serve the city. They'd probably go to some of the other places, but it was also a gambling establishment, so. We don't know for, for sure there. Um, most of the, the casinos, when they got started, or the gambling establishments, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things, you start using some of the terms that we use today, resort, casino, things like that. That didn't tend to be what was used, as you well know, at the time. They were clubs, you know, saloons, that sort of thing. You know, they didn't, you know, the Northern was never the Northern Casino. The Rex was never the Rex Casino. It was the club. You know, but today we use those terms, so they you know, got to kind of, kind of watch that. But we did have a number of ones that were downtown, but we also had some out on the highway, out on the Arrowhead Trail Highway. 
Now the Arrowhead Trail Highway, this is in the early 30s, this is before it was the strip. This was the road that you could take from Los Angeles to Las Vegas and up to Salt Lake City. It was a named highway. It was one of those highways that we started building in the late teens. And the idea behind the highway was to give an all-weather route from the east to California. Because the northern routes, the Lincoln Highway, and some of those were closed for months at a time because of snow. But a highway coming down here through Las Vegas could stay open year round. And we figured a lot more people would come to Las Vegas that way because we were still very little. And there wasn't much reason to come here. No, but if we had the highway coming through here, well, that's pretty good. Of course, we didn't start paving it until the mid 20s. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it was completely paved until maybe World War II, it may have been a little bit after that. So you gotta kind of watch what you say when you say highway as well. But it was a through road and it was a named road. And the one stretch of it that you can still drive is that stretch from Gene to downtown. That's the original Highway 91, the original Arrowhead Trail Highway route. So if you're here and you want to just drive a little historic piece of road. That one is still there. But they, they did start a few clubs out there. They had, uh, of course, the Paradise. Now, some of you might think that Paradise Valley here in, in the, the uh, Clark County is named for the Paradise, and the Paradise Township is named for the Paradise. You would be incorrect, however. They are actually named for the fact that the Paradise Valley area was the best place for farms in 1908 and 1909 and became known as Paradise at that point. The Paradise didn't come along until 1931. So it's a much later club and it's a much later play on words. Um, one of the ones that showed up out there on, on the strip, or what we think of as the strip today, on the highway that I happen to like, was um, Liberty's Last Stand. Y'all know Liberty's Last Stand? The Prohibition agents knew that we weren't really good about being temperance fanatics in Las Vegas. They knew that there was booze everywhere, and they knocked, you know, they kept having these raids and having these raids and having these raids and we would just start drinking again. So they finally decided that what they would do was conduct a sting operation. And they actually created a club called Liberty's Last Stand that was a sting operation. It was run by a man named Kelly, who was a local uh, real estate agent, and so everybody knew him, and they figured you know, he was safe, except they actually had um, a room up above the main floor where they had dictaphones set up, and they had guys up there taking notes and taking pictures. They had holes in the ceiling where they could photograph everyone. And they actually set up a sting operation that ran for a couple of months on the highway. And the idea was they were going to finally catch all these evil bootleggers until they figured out it was most of the leading members of the community that were coming in there. Now they ended up arresting a whole bunch of them most of them never went to jail. A few of the actual bootleggers did a month or two, but that was it. And Mr. Kelly, well, Mr. Kelly and his family had to be taken out of town at night in the back seat of a car under a blanket so that they wouldn't be killed for what they had done. Nobody was really happy about Liberty's Last Stand. But if you ever run into something from Liberty's Last Stand, that's an interesting one. That's one that you, you might want to know a little bit more about. We also had the Red Rooster out there. That was Alice Wilson Morris who had that one. And uh, I, don't, I, liked, I looked it up. When she got her gaming license in April of 1931, and she had been raided a number of times. She's interesting because she's also the first person in this area, in Clark County, to lose her gaming license after getting it. She got her gaming license in April of 1931. She had one table game and three slot machines. And again, it was just covering up the speakeasy. 
And she ended up losing her, her gaming license in July 1931 because she was serving booze. We don't really do that, do we? Any place we can. But she, she has the distinction of being the first person to get a gaming license and lose a gaming license in Las Vegas. Not the last, you know. A lot of the early clubs had their gaming license, lost their gaming license, got it back again, lost it again, got it back again. Because they were doing other things. It was, it was a, a blind for them as they were getting started. Um, now downtown, we had four big clubs in the 1930s. It was J. Kellogg Households, Las Vegas Club, you probably are all aware of that. Prosper Gumon's Boulder Club. And if you haven't been, by the way, this is the part where you get the shameless uh, ad for the Clark County Museum, which is the most wonderful place to go in the Vegas Valley. I know it, I run it, and I'm an expert, so I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we actually have Prosper Gumon's house at the Clark County Museum, so you can come out and actually walk through the home of one of these early club owners. But there is the, the Boulder Club, uh, Mamie Stocker's Northern Club, and the Apache Bar. Those were considered the big four on Fremont Street at that time. Now when you think about it, we had a number of clubs that would go in and out of business. They'd be here for a year or two, three, and then they'd go out of business because we were so small. There was only so much traffic through here. The thing that kept Las Vegas alive in the 1930s wasn't the divorce um, efforts. You know, that, that most people, when they wanted to get divorced, they didn't come to Las Vegas, they went to Reno. In fact, getting divorced was called getting renovated or taking the Nevada cure. It was both of us. So they weren't coming here. We were still very small. It wasn't the gaming. That wasn't drawing people here. What kept us alive during the 30s was this huge dam project and all the federal money that was coming in. And then towards the end of the 30s, the federal government started looking at us, thanks to uh, Patrick McCarran, among others, as a place for a major military base. Because they knew the war was coming and they had to do something there. So again, we started getting a lot of federal money coming in here. That kept Las Vegas going. And it was that federal money paying men and women that were working for them who then had the money to go in and play at the clubs and drink and all of that and, and keep all of these clubs going. And during World War II, of course, that's when we started getting the first of the big car, uh, uh, sawdust joints out on Boulder Highway, you know, you get the El Rancho, you get the Last Frontier. I always like to point out the Last Frontier was also the club that, and, and by the way, if you see pictures of the Last Frontier, if you look at it closely, you can see the paradise. They built the paradise into the Last Frontier. They built the building into it. And you can actually track that building. And then the paradise became Club 91 and all of that, but that building was part of the last frontier. But also at the last frontier, you had the last frontier village later on, in the later 50s. And this was the first time that we did basically a family-friendly attraction on the strip. This was a place that didn't have any gaming, but you could take uh, stagecoach rides, you could go to the gun shop or the leather shop or the candy shop or you know all of these historic buildings that have been brought down by uh, Toby Dock who was an interesting character who liked to steal things from ghost towns, including buildings. Um, and he brought down a whole bunch of buildings. And they built a little western town. And in fact, Carrie, did you ever go there? Oh yeah, a lot of times. OK, yeah. And there may be some more of you that were here back in the late 50s, early 60s. You know, it was one of the things to do. But it, it was a family-friendly sort of place to go. You know, something that we think is something from just a few years ago. No, there's not much new under the sun. We just keep reinventing ourselves and coming up with something that we did 20 years ago and doing it over again.
We had all of this going on on the Strip during World War II, but that wasn't the only place, of course, that we had gaming going on. As soon as Boulder Highway was created, we started getting some communities along here. Now I'm going to jump back into the 30s. Because when you look at Boulder Highway, you have to realize Boulder Highway never existed before Boulder City. There was no highway there. There was kind of a dirt track that you could kind of follow from down at El Dorado Canyon across Railroad Pass and then kind of eventually sort of to Fremont Street. But there was no highway. It was not that straight road that you see. That came in 1930 and 31 because they knew that they were going to need a road down to what was going to become Boulder City. And I always think of it as an engineer's road because you know somebody just laid a, a straight edge on a map and said, okay, that's where the road goes. And, and did this absolutely straight road that has no sense when you look at all the other roads around it. Because it cuts diagonally through everybody's property and that, but it, it's, it's going from, Boulder, from Fremont Street to Railroad Canyon and there's no bend in it. But, so they, they had built that, as soon as they built that, people started looking at it and saying, well, you know, I've got this chunk of property, maybe I can put a town here. And so you get towns like Whitney being created, not by Stowell Whitney, who it's named for, but by the people who, re, uh, who took uh, uh, Whitney's ranch um, after he lost it to, to bankruptcy. But you have Whitney, Whitney later became East Las Vegas, and then it went back to Whitney. Um, you also have a place, called Jericho Heights, which later became St. Anne, and then became uh, Midway, and now is known as Pittman. But these were towns that were developed in the 30s along there. They were also towns that, as they were laid out, especially Whitney, was like North Las Vegas. North Las Vegas was also laid out in the early 30s. And the problem with the early 30s is we were in the Depression. Nobody had any money. The only people that had money were bootleggers. So they would come in, and if there was water in the town, and Whitney had water, and North Las Vegas had water, the bootleggers would come in, and they were the ones that bought most of the property there. And so these became bootlegging hotspots in the valley. You know, and they'd get knocked over by the prohibitionists each time, but that's all right. All that means is you buy a new still, and you set up again. You know, so, and that's all going on along Boulder Highway. So you had, you had uh, Railroad Pass, the casino going down there, and then you had other little ones that were being created along the highway there. And uh, in fact, one of them, uh, it's one that, that unfortunately we just lost the building uh, within the last few months. But some of you have probably been through, uh, been along Boulder Highway. You might remember a yellow Quonset hut in uh, Pittman that was right next to the Joker's Wild, or real close to the Joker's Wild there. That was actually Jim Thorpe's bar in 1947. Jim Thorpe, the Indian the, and all of that, yes. He actually had a bar here in 1947. Unfortunately, it's been torn down. Um, should have been saved, I think, but that's just me. Um, but we've got all of this going on. We're in World War II now. We've got all of the, the growth going on because of the war. We've got this, this new community of Henderson that's created just as housing for the people working at Basic Magnesium. And Basic Magnesium comes in here because Pat McCarran really pushed for it. It was considered, among other things, the worst example of war profiteering of any plant in the United States. Thank you, you know, Basic Magnesium. <laughs> But, uh, you know, so you've got new communities being uh, set up there. You've got the Flexible Gunnery School at the air base. The, the uh, air base is, is put at Western Air Express Field. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue here because I like telling some of these stories. And, and it doesn't really fit here, but it's one of those only in Las Vegas stories. In 1940, we elected a new mayor by the name of John Russell. And John Russell, there had been a lot of, of infighting on the city council, and they thought that John Russell was going to come in and everybody was going to get along with each other. Well, what they didn't understand was John Russell was a socialist. And so immediately, the city council decided that they hated the mayor. 
So if you're on the city council of Las Vegas, Nevada, and you happen to hate the mayor, what do you do? You resign. The entire city council resigned. The mayor said, okay, fine. He appointed a new city council. The city attorney said, whoa, time out. You can't do that. You can't resign. You can't all resign because the only people that can accept a resignation is the city council. So only one person can resign because the other city council members have to accept that resignation. The mayor cannot do that. So you guys have to stay in, in office still. The mayor said, no, I got a new city council. Well, this went all the way to the state Supreme Court, and it's being battled out in the state Supreme Court. Who's the real city council? So you've got both city councils meeting concurrently in the same room. <laughs> and they don't get along with each other. They hate each other. In the midst of all of this, the Army Air Corps shows up. And they say, we want to put a training base here. Well, that's one thing that city councils can agree with, because that's a lot of money. And they're saying, yeah. And they're saying, well, but the only way that we can do this is if you own the airport here. Now, the airport, which was where, it was McCarran Airport, was where the, the uh, Nellis Air Force Base is now. So they have to work out an agreement with Western Air Express, who owns the airport. And then both city councils have to sign this agreement. Well, they have to sign identical agreements, because nobody knows who's legal. So they do this, and then they have to have an agreement with the federal government to turn over management of it and ownership of the land around it to the federal government. But they have to have two identical ones, signed by different people on the same day, because they don't know who's legal. And that's what they ended up doing. We have two city councils. Both of them have to sign, and it's, it's the same agreement. If you go back to, to the National Archives, same agreement, two city councils, only Vegas. You know? So what ended up happening, the state Supreme Court said, yes, the city attorney is correct. New city council, you're out. Old city council, you're back in. If you're the old city council, what do you do? You indict the mayor, of course, for malfeasance in office. You fight with him for another six months until he goes up on Mount Charleston for a weekend and has a heart attack and dies. Um, and the only thing we've got left from, from Mayor Russell is Russell Boulevard. It's named for him because that's where his ranch was. But I, I, I just love that story. When you're, when you're dealing with Vegas history, it's like, we've got just such weird things here. But, you know, we get to the end of World War II and we're looking at the fact that basic magnesium has closed down in late 1944. We made enough magnesium to burn down all of Japan. We don't need it. The Army Air Base has closed down. The Flexible Gunnery School has. They're, they're working on mothballing that. The dam is done. There's no money coming in. It's 1945. Local businesses are looking at each other and they're saying, what are we going to do? There is no reason for people to come here. We're a little town in the middle of the desert. So what do they do? Well, they put together what was called the Livewire Fund. And they started advertising Las Vegas. Now, all of this does actually affect gaming, of course, because we had to bring people in here. And the Livewire Fund was one of these things where we don't care what you say about it, just spell the name correctly. And they just advertised everywhere. More money was spent by Las Vegas in 1945 and 1946 per capita to advertise itself than any other community in the United States. And it became a place to go. You know, we had those, those uh, casinos that were on the strip that had become more resorts than that. They were advertising, you know, play by day, play by night, you could ride and, and you know, go in the pool during the day, and then you had the club, and you had gaming, and you had all the entertainment, and all the great food at night. So they were, they were already setting this up. And then, of course, we got Bugsy Siegel, who had almost nothing to do with us, I want you to know. I always love the people that think that somehow nothing ever happened here, and Bugsy Siegel showed up in the middle of the desert and said, let there be flamingo, and everything grew up out of the sand. <laughs> that did not happen. Apart from being a thug and a psychopath, uh, Bugsy Siegel basically stole the idea for the flamingo from a fellow named Billy Wilkerson. 
who owned the Brown Derby in California, was very well known. And he had come up with this idea for a carpet joint, one that wasn't an Old West themed place, like the Last Frontier in the El Rancho. And it was going to be a fancier place. And eventually, basically, you know, he, he borrowed some money from, from Bugsy, which he never said, he always said Mr. Siegel. Because if you said Bugsy, he'd probably kill you on the spot. Um, and, and Siegel eventually allowed him to sell out to him, um, either that or die. Um, and he started building the casino here. Now, he was borrowing money from his mob buddies in order to build it. And one of the things you can say about Bugsy Siegel, no matter what the movies tell you and all of that sort of thing, is he was completely incompetent as a businessman. You've got to understand, this is a guy who borrows money from his buddies to build this thing, has huge cost overruns, is trying to plow money back in after he opens it, and gets to live for just about a year after he opens until they shoot him. Now, in case you think that the shot that killed him had nothing to do with the club here, let me tell you a story that I was told by uh, Peg Crockett, a union. George Crockett, her husband, lived at what is now McCarran Airport. At that point, it was a private airport that he had created called Alamo Field. And he was out there, and a friend of his had come in. This was before he and Peg were married. He was a single man living there at the airport, the buddy had come in, and you know they didn't know what they were going to do for the evening. He said, let's go down to this new casino, just opened up, it's called the Flamingo, you know, and we'll gamble a little bit, see if we can make enough to get a meal and get a, a show. And they showed up, and, and of course, Las Vegas was so little, everybody knew everybody. So he walks up to one of the table games, and the guy that's doing the dealing said, what are you doing here, George? And he said, oh, I'm just trying to make enough money to get a, a meal and a, and a show for my buddy and I. And by God, he made enough money for a meal and a show for his buddy and he. So they go into the show, and they're shown right down front, you know, and they're sitting there. And right next to them is a table of six guys who are not eating. They are not drinking. They are not watching the show. They are just sitting there. And about halfway through the show, a guy comes in from outside, leans over and says something to each one of the six guys, and walks back out. And they all get up and they all leave. And George had noticed this, George and his friend, because well, they didn't seem to be having a good time. They thought it was a good show. So they walk out and they're going to head back down to the airport for the, you know, to, to go back to his place. And they see one of the guys at the cash cage and one at the front door, and one at the door to the offices. And, you know, they're strategically placed all over the casino. And they get back down to the airport, turn on the radio, and there's a news flash. Bugsy Siegel's just been killed. Hmm. Don't know that there was any conclusion there to be made, but absolutely. He was shot because he was such an incompetent businessman and, and you know, lost too much money on that. But the, Flamingo did set up for something new in terms of the carpet joints. And what happened after that was the casinos started realizing they had to advertise as well, and that's what they did. That's how we ended up becoming the wedding capital of the world because they would start, they would give anybody who's famous a free wedding. <coughs> if you would come and let them photograph your wedding, because then they would use that to advertise. So Las Vegas became known as the wedding capital. In case you wonder whether we're still the wedding capital of the world, 5%, a full 5% of all the weddings in the United States every year happen in Clark County. I know, I feel like, like dude, are you kidding me? No, that's, that's actually based on the stats, all the wedding licenses and that sort of thing. 5% of all the weddings in the United States happen in Clark County. Not in Nevada, in Clark County. You know? So we ended up starting to grow Throughout all of this time, you know, we've, we've gone from being, we need gaming in order to, to uh, cover up for illegal drinking, to how do we get more people to come in? How do, how do we advertise it? How do we get you here? 
And that's what happened in the first 20 years of gaming in Southern Nevada. Now, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, um, and or uh, about anything. You want to talk about the museum? You want to talk about Pawn Stars? You want to talk about the new show I'm on on H2 called United Stuff of History? You know, if you like to hear me talk about stuff, you'll see me all over the place. Uh, but if you have to answer any questions, you might have. Not Yes, sir. Last year we had the uh, speaker here who was in, from uh, UNLV, who was in charge of the gaming history department. Uh, David Schwartz? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he presented uh, a theory on who killed Buggy's cousin Seal as being uh, Virginia Hill's brother, that he beat her up, and uh, she told the brother. And he is was a sharpshooter, and it was decided that Bugsy Siegel was shot with shot with a, with, a, with a rifle as opposed to a pistol, which is the usual. Well, he was shot from a distance. From a distance. There, there, there were a lot of sharpshooters in 1947. Right. They'd all come through the war, and and I, I understand that. I don't agree with it. Uh -huh. You know, and and one of the things that I found is some of these stories are very diff difficult to um, prove. Um, I have found in my, my work with, with Peg Crockett over the years, because I've, I've interviewed her a number of times, because one of my museums is the Aviation Museum at the Terran International Airport, and I have found her to be accurate. So the idea that they took over that casino so quickly makes me think that Mom couldn't care less whether he beat up Virginia Hill. Right. And uh, they, if they used her brother, then that wouldn't surprise me a bit. But they just used him. You know, he was, he was convenient. You know, that's, that's one of the things, when I first read about Bugsy, you know, the Bugsy Siegel shooting, you know, they were talking about, oh, he was shot from a distance. It's like, not very far. And if you've ever shot an M1 Garand, <coughs> and I have, they are surprisingly accurate rifles. And if you have just come out of World War II, that's not a hard shot. You know, it, it's, it's, don't lose money for the mob. It's just, it's, it's a fairly simple rule. You know? <laughs> and, uh, I'll tell you one other story about, about Bugsy that came up many years later, related to the airport. The fellow who ran the airport between 1958 and 1965, I interviewed many years ago, just before his death. And he was telling me a story that when he took over the airport in 1958, he met a couple of guys, bent noses, who were here in town, and they were kind of chuckling. They said, yeah, we know you. They said, no, I don't think we've ever met. I said, no, we never met, but uh, Mr. Siegel had us follow you for about two months. And when he was trying to figure out whether or not we were going to hit you. And he said, what? And it turned out when he had first come back to town in 1946 from the war, he wanted to build a club. And there was no lumber to be had or no supplies to be had. And he noticed that all the supplies that were going into the Flamingo Project, most of them didn't have any inspectors' marks on them. They, they, were, they were coming in, they, they were obviously illegal. And so he started taking pictures of this and trying to get the local newspapers to cover it. And the, the, the RJ said, uh-uh. You know, and Hank Greenspun, which was, was Siegel's publicist, said, I don't think so. You know, and he finally got one article written in a little weekly down in Boulder City, at which point no other articles were written. So he gave up on it. He figured, you know, okay, I can't do anything about this. I don't know what's going on. But 10 years later, a little over 10 years later, he's now the director of the Department of Aviation for Clark County. And he's being told by a couple of guys that he's being interviewed for, or being, he's, being, he's being introduced to that they almost killed him 10 years before because Muggsy didn't like the article that he had written about him. <laughs> uh, so he was here. He did have his influence here. Yes, sir? You know the history of the Desert Inn in its beginning, why it stopped construction? And the second part of the question is, next door was the plane. Say that again. The restaurant called the plane. I could 
couldn't tell you offhand. I've not done anything on it. I know the Desert Inn, and, and I know of it, but I haven't done any specific history on it. Uh, but there's there's a lot out there on the Desert Inn. The DI is well enough known, and you guys probably, there, there's probably a couple of people here that could speak to that very directly. Uh, one of, one of the, the realities of what I do is I do research for what I'm going to be speaking on, and then, you know, that's, that's one that was not in the time period that I was really covering, so I didn't pick up on it for this one. Um, no, not on the plane? No, not on hand. I'm sure I could find it, but not on hand. Yes, um, I've got a question related to the Pawn Stars. Uh, <laughs> no, it only isn't stupid. But. No, no. <laughs> what, what I've wondered is, we only see on TV you walking in or someone else walking in looking surprised at what you're seeing. Do they ever give you a tip and say, oh, yes. hey, come on down? And no. what well, is they, they call, they, they, well, they, they either call or say, okay. normally it's an email okay. these days. Okay. And they'll say, can you be an expert for X, Y, or Z? Yeah. And uh, I was talking to a few people earlier, they're, they're at least close on what they think it is about 70% of the time. 30% of the time, they have no clue whatsoever. Or what they think it is, and what the seller is telling them it is, it isn't. So I take whatever they give me, and I go from there. I do all my own research, and as, as do all of us, now, all the, the experts. And so when we come in, we know the piece that we're going to look at. Now, there have been times. Um, there was a, a piece I did that was a part of the computing mechanism on the upper turret of, a B, of, a, of an A26 uh, from World War II that I got an email from them with a really bad cell phone photo that was out of focus, and they said, it's, it's a Norton bomb site. I said, oh, okay, fine, I can talk about Norton bomb sites. And I got down to the shop, and I looked at this black box, and I said, this isn't a Norton bomb site. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> I said, we're going to hold up for, for a minute. You're going to get me a computer, because I've got to do some work. You know? And it turned out to be the middle computing mechanism, of a three-part computing mechanism used on the upper turret of an A26 to align the two 50-caliber machine guns to cross their, their streams of bullets to cross at a certain distance out away from the plane when they were firing at another uh, uh, an enemy aircraft. But so that will happen sometimes. You know, but I try to know when I get there so they don't have to wait for me. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, obviously you do your research on the internet now, but I was wondering before well, you got the internet, do you I, have an extensive library of your own? I, I have 20,000 volumes in my house. I have two storage units that are full, and a garage. Garages are just engine storage units. <laughs> yeah, and, and you have to understand that, that my wife is a professor as well at, at UNLV. Uh, is actually the smart one in the family. She's the one with the PhD. And he is a national scholar on quilting in the 1950s and 60s. So we have in, in just you know an extensive library. And the thing about the, the internet, I do use it, and everybody ought to. But it does not have everything, and it never will. And much of what it has, you know, I've gotten tired of correcting Wikipedia. <laughs> you know, I have corrected too many sites there. It's just, you, you, you really have to step back and vet what you're looking at. You know, check those references at the bottom. If they all come up as a 404 error, don't trust them. You know, there's, there's a lot of that stuff that, People can put anything out there. I, mean, I, I, I hate to tell you this, there's a website out there. If you look it up, it will tell you that I have come out of the closet as gay. <laughs> now, I don't have any issue with gays, or lesbians, or transgender, or queer, or whatever. But I've been married 35 years, I've got two kids, I'm real happy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a site out there called Ask Cha Cha. <laughs> that will tell you that I'm gay. Why? Because they mixed me up with some guy named Mark Patton that was on Lost, I think. <laughs> so that I only say I use it, but I vet it like I would any other source. I do not trust it just as is. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, right. could, you, could you cover a little bit of the uh, fund that all the hotels kicked into in order to advertise? The and library the, fund? And the Desert Sea uh, News Bureau. That right, and, and that's, that's what, they, what it ended up creating. The Desert Sea News Bureau that, that Terry's talking about ended up becoming the Las Vegas News Bureau that we have today. But the Desert Sea was, was the original one, and the idea was, I, and I'm blanking on the guy saying, who's the guy that better with that? Don Which one? Don Payne. No, no, he came along later. The, the guy that initially set it up, I, I'm blanking on his name right now, but they brought in a guy from California to, to run this and to just advertise. The idea was we needed to advertise because we were in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't easy to get here. Yes, we had aviation. We've had aviation, commercial aviation, since 1920. You know, we've had airports here, all of that sort of thing. But it still, there wasn't any reason to come here. And so, the, this desert, uh, uh, the Desert Sea uh, News Bureau, that the originator of the, of the Las Vegas News Bureau, was really just trying to do anything to advertise. One of the things they started doing very early on was, was photographing anybody who came from a, a town somewhere else. If you're from some town in Nebraska, they take your picture and then send it with a little note, a little uh, press release to your town newspaper. So, you know, George Schmoe and his wife, uh, Adrian, you know, were, were seen at the Desert Inn, you know, at, uh, when, when they were visiting Las Vegas and that sort of thing. They would do anything they could to try to get to it. They set up scenes, you know. There, there's a great picture, and you've probably all seen it, of these guys standing around a floating craps table and, and playing craps. There was no floating craps tables. <laughs> it's just a made up one. We got one that's in, when, they, when they, they were first fishing out at Lake Mead, we've got a great shot of one of the casinos, boats out there, and all these guys, and they're pulling up all these, these long, skinny fish. And you start looking at them, and you're going, wait a minute. And it turns out those were all frozen barracudas <laughs> that somebody had found. And so they took them out there and hooked them on the, the, the legs. So they had something on the end of their line. You know, but that, that was the thing. It was, it was just, you had to have it. You had to bring people in here. And Anything that you could do to do that. You know, when you think about those pictures of the grizzled prospector and his mule, here, give my mule a drink too. <laughs> they weren't coming into Fremont Street. You know, when we created El Dorado back in the 30s, there was never an old west here. Las Vegas was founded in 1905. You know, but we created a El Dorado, we created a past for ourselves. Okay. You know, <laughs> it's like a lot of this, we, we just did not have a problem with promotion. And it's just whatever you need to do. And, and they, they were, they, they, the, the Desert Seas uh, News Bureau was, was the one that really built up the image of Las Vegas. You know, it's, it's hugely important in the post-war Las Vegas image, what we think of Las Vegas today. Yes, ma'am. I've got one of first over here. Yes. Uh, the, the movie Casino with Mr. Garbison, Lefty Rosenthal, and all yep. of that crew. Is that anywhere close to the truth? And do you have any anecdotes for what really went on during that time? No. And no. But yeah, Lefty Rosenthal was here. You know, didn't have his show. Didn't try to blow him up. You know, a couple minor things like that. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and I've talked to people that, that remember the explosion and all that sort of thing. The, what, what I have found is nearly any show that is set in Las Vegas not only gets it wrong, but recreates even more myths. Nowadays, I go to shows like that just to try to figure out what I'm going to have to say no to uh, now. Uh, my favorite was the recent television show, Vegas, with Ralph Lamb, you know, with his brothers who never worked for him, and you know, all of that sort of thing. My, my son uh, called me one night, and he said, Dad, I'm, I'm talking to some friends, and 
I know it's not accurate, but is there anything accurate about the show? And I said, Ralph Lamb's name was Ralph Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. You know, so that's what you run into. I mean, yes, they take little pieces like the explosion, and yes, he did have a television show or that. They even find shows out there. But no, not they, 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 the way they recreated it. Yes, they were killed in a, a, a cornfield, I think, uh, back east in that. But no, you know, they, 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 the, the, the accuracy is, has been modified so greatly that it needs to go into the fiction category. Yes, sir? Clifford Jones was one of the early attorneys in Vegas. And yeah. was responsible for a lot of the casino development and so forth. Eventually became lieutenant governor. Right. And then became blacklisted and went on to mm -hmm. open up a lot of casinos mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. I've been trying to find connections between him and the boys back east, if you will. Yeah. I'm sure we can probably find some. Um, I can't tell you any right offhand. Um, I'm more familiar with Glenn Jones, who was the sheriff here, and yeah, all of his involvement with Four Mile and that sort of thing, because he was, he was the, the sheriff that ended up losing you know, out of that. But there, there's, I know of Cliff Jones and that, but I don't know of any ties offhand, you know. Uh, but I have to, you know, that's one of those that, if, if there were, you'd probably be able to find it. There was a number of, of interviews done with folks. Uh, there's a great uh, long oral history with uh, uh, Lou, uh, the lawyer here, he's got a school name for him. I'm blanking on it, Lou Wiener. Um, and talks about, he, he, it's, it's surprisingly open, you know, for, for somebody. But you know, if there were ties, you'd probably find them there. And at least you'd find references to them. I don't know that there were, you know, um, offhand because I haven't tracked him. You know, but again, on, on a lot of these, it really takes a lot of time to track a particular individual or particular questions. And with six television shows and, and three museums, I, I don't have the time I wish I had. You know, but um, uh, if you're if you're curious, give me a yell one of these days, and uh, we'll see what we can find. Yes, sir. Yeah, two things. I, I understand what you're saying about the television. So I worked with soap operas for a number of years. <laughs> they didn't care about reality. They just wanted to worry about what the story wanted to say yep. and, and the in action that came along with it, the drama that went along with it. The other thing is, where are you from originally? You don't sound like you're from this area. I'm not. I'm fourth generation of Orange County, California. My great grandfather settled outside of Orange in 1869. I have been in my field though for 37 years. I did my BA work at UCI and then I went to the University of Delaware for graduate school. So I've bounced all over the country. I, I founded the Anaheim Museum. I, I worked at Bowers. I ran the Orange Historical Society. I ran San Luis Obispo County. I was in South Dakota and Sioux Falls for three years. And, in, in the museum field, you tend to move to where the museums are. For some reason, they won't move them to you. I think they want to. But, and then, uh, almost 21 years ago, I got the nod to create the Aviation Museum over here. And I brought my family over. We looked at the community and said, yeah, there's a really nice community here. So we moved over here. And uh, I've been here ever since. And just so that you know, I, I started out running the Howard W. Cannon Aviation Museum, that's the one at the airport, and two other airports here. And then eight years ago, my colleague retired and ran the County Museum and the Searchlight Museum. And the county, in its, in its glory and, and care, said, you know, you're doing really good with a full-time job. Here, have another one. <laughs> and they gave me those two museums, but they were, you know, they were lawful. They didn't ask me to take any more money. <laughs> and you know, so they cared about me. You know, so I now run the, the three museums for Clark County. And everybody oh, yes, sir. Yeah, can you tell us about the personalities of the people at Monster State? Chumley is is not uh, No, he's not stupid. Actually he's 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 got a really interesting interestingly role sense of humor because he comes up with his own lines. And uh, 
But the, the old man is just as crusty as he seems. You know, he's a, he's a nice guy. I enjoy talking with him. He reminds me a lot of my dad, who's a 20-year Navy vet. You know, and if you get down to the pawn shop, and he's there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he's asleep. <laughs> you know, Rick, Rick grew up with epilepsy. He's actually a national spokesman for the Epilepsy Foundation. And um, one of the things that that meant was that he had grandma seizures. Whenever he'd have one, he'd be in bed for a couple of weeks, recovering from it afterwards. So he did a lot of reading. That's why he's, he's you know, he is very interestingly knowledgeable. He's not an historian, so it's not necessarily connected. But he does have this wide-ranging background. It's kind of fun because I'm one of the few people when I show up down there and he says, what do you know about, you know, the, the American intervention in Russia in 1919? And I say, well, we took more of the country than Bolsheviks did. This is why we did it. This is what. And, and he loves it because I'm the only guy that he's run into that he can do that with and, and actually knows something about what he's talking about. You know, Corey's just, I mean, he's, he's the grandson. He's the kid that's coming up into the business. I think he ought to stay off motorcycles. Um, he has a tattoo on his arm that says Harley David. <laughs> That's three wrecks worth of falls. Um, he says when, he, when all of David gets gone, then he might get off motorcycles. I don't believe him. And he and Corey have been friends literally since junior high school. They grew up actually out by where my museum is off of Horizon. Uh, you know, didn't grow up with anything. They, they, uh, if you ever read License to Bond, Rick's autobiography, uh, which is very good read, by the way. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but they talk honestly about the fact that both of them were meth addicts for a while and they had to pull themselves out of that. And, you, know, they, they, you know, they are, it is a pawn shop. It was Rick's idea to do the show in the first place. And it really, you know, when, when you look at it, it is not scripted in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so, in fact, someone would say, you know, no one on the air. Um, it, is, it is pretty much what you see. The, what isn't real about it is it's, it's scheduled. You know, the only part of it is when Rick says, let me go call my buddy Mark, I'm standing behind the camera. Because it takes about four hours to do one of those little eight minute segments. You know, because I'm a half an hour away. You know, so I've got to drive down there. It's got to work in my schedule. Can't have any meetings or anything. I've got to drive down there, and I've got to wait around for a half an hour, 45 minutes. You who worked with uh, uh, the media before know what film crews are like. These guys are idiots. They can't get their, their act together. I don't have to tell you. But you know, you'll be sitting there for a half an hour, 45 minutes. If you're a minute late, they'll call you. But all you're going to do is sit there the whole time. You know, and then they finally say, okay, now we're ready to go do it. Okay, then you have to kick everybody out of the, out of the place, let 10 or 15 back in as background people. You know, then you film the whole piece. Then you let people back in, but you have to film the finger pointing. <laughs> you know, they, they, they like my fingers. They look okay on camera. Um, but <laughs> actually, there's one, and I won't tell you which episode, but there's one where they, get, where they messed up back at left field. And it was the funniest thing, I was watching the, the episode one time, and I looked at it, and it, had, it was Rick, and then it cut away to supposedly Rick Point. And I said, no, that's my Rick. <laughs> no, Rick, you stole my hand. <laughs> um, but then, you know, we have to do that, we do the stand-ups, and then I have to get back out to the museum. So that part of it, you know, that, that's sketchy. But, what you see said, they don't know what I'm going to say when I show up. Hell, I don't know what I'm going to say when I show up. You know, and I know what I know about the item, but I don't know where I'm going to go with the stories in that. And they don't, they don't, a number of times, they don't even know where I'm going to say it's real. You know, it's kind of funny, because I'll be sitting there waiting, and I'll be talking with the director and that, and, and Rick and everybody. And I'll say, well, do you think it's real? And I said, do you want to know? I'll tell you. And the director said, no, 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 wait, wait till we're filming. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I'm honest with people. You know? my, my idea is I want to get the information out. I don't want to plan. You know, but so we, it's, 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 it's like that. And, and the guys are, you know, they're friendly. They're nice guys. I mean, Corey and, and Chumley are, are, they're always playing jokes on each other. They're playing jokes on their dad. 
you know, if you wonder about whether or not they fuss at each other, oh God, yes. You, know, you should have been around before uh, Rick's wedding last year to his third wife and listen to Corey going after Rick, you know, trying to quote him what the stats are for success of third marriage and so on. That sort of thing. And Rick's like, I don't want to hear that. I don't care. You know, but, but they all do love each other. I mean, and, and that's the other part of it. It is, it is, it really is a family. You know, it's, it's an all-male pawn par- shop family. But it is a family, and you, and you do see that when you see them. You know, they, they're always fussing at each other off camera as well. You know, but it's, it's fussing. You know, it's not, it's, it's not mean, it's just they're, that's interaction. You know, so. Yes, sir. Oh, Gary, yeah. I want to thank you for coming out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us. It's been great. Thank you, Gary.